Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 115, The September Campaign, part 7, September 1st, 1939. Before we get started today, I wanted to just briefly discuss how the podcast is going to cover the September campaign, or the German invasion of Poland. In my opinion, the best way to do so on a podcast like this one is to break it up into logical chunks, with the first period being September 1st through September 4th. During those three frantic days, the German invasion would begin, and the first major defeats of Polish forces in the field would occur, with Polish armies all along the border retreating back, roughly, in the direction of Warsaw. Over the next five episodes, we will discuss these three days by looking at the experiences of various geographic regions of fighting, starting in the north and then working our way to the south. My goal with this arrangement is to make the action easy to follow, especially around geography, which I know can be really tough in an audio-only format like a podcast. And so with all that out of the way, on to the episode. The German invasion of Poland was scheduled to begin at 4.45am on September 1st, 1939. The order for the invasion had been given the day before, and it had been confirmed in the evening as units began to deploy to their jumping-off points. All along the border between Germany and Poland, German troops would move forward closer to the border, reach their jumping-off points, and then begin what was at times the most difficult task, to wait. In Moravia, on the southern end of the German invasion, Karl Fischer would write of the hours before the invasion that, quote, The two hours before an attack are an eternity. If only we had something to do, but we lie pressed to the ground and must wait. Nothing but waiting. As the final moments approached, Staff Officer Johann Graf von Kielsmanseg of the 1st Panzer Division would later recall thinking, quote, I light a cigarette. When it goes out, the war will be on, another two minutes before the war begins. It's a strange and provocative feeling to experience a historic moment whose significance cannot be predicted so consciously or so directly, End quote. On the other side of the border, Polish troops were also waiting, although they did not know what danger was close at hand. War had seemed imminent for weeks, as the various attempts at negotiations had failed time and time again. On September 1st, around Poland, newspapers would be printed, speaking of increased readiness and preparations, and the resolve of the government not to give in to Germany and Hitler's demands. They did not know it at the time, but when they were being read in the morning, such headlines were already outdated. What nobody really knew is exactly what would happen if an attack began. Sure, the Germans might know that they were going to advance into Poland, but they didn't really 100% know what they were going to find there and what the, the defense of the Poles would be. The Poles knew that the Germans might attack, but they didn't necessarily know exactly where or, or when or how those attacks would develop. Now, we know today that in terms of manpower, Germany would have around a two-to-one advantage. But in all forms of equipment, the difference was far more stark. Three-to-one in artillery, three-to-one in tanks, five-to-one in aircraft. Like, this was not an even fight. But at the time, the exact advantage was not precisely known. The German war machine, though, long prepared, first in secrecy and then openly, was ready for its first major campaign. But while the German soldiers waited near the front, operations were already underway, not for military reasons, but for political ones. For political reasons, both domestic and international, Hitler and the German leaders felt that it would be better if they were not strictly seen as the aggressors in the upcoming invasion. This had been a major focus of pro German propaganda leading up to the war, with many claims that ethnic Germans were being killed by the Poles and, and that the Polish government was doing other provocative things. Sort of that was the main focus of the German press before the start of the war. The actions of the SS during the night of August 31st to September 1st was really just a crescendo for these efforts. The precise route of what would come to be known as Operation Himmler would be in mid-August 1939, when Reinhard Heydrich, head of the SD, would communicate some orders for the SS to arrange for an attack on a German radio station near the Polish border. The attack would take place, and then the Poles would be blamed for the attack to give the impression that the Poles had struck first in the upcoming war, several hours before the German invasion began. This would then be trumpeted to foreign and domestic press as an excuse for the German invasion. At Nuremberg, Alfred Helmut Nonjox 
would give a testimony about the operation, stating that he was personally ordered by Heydrich to perform the operation and carry out the attack on the radio station. He would then go on to say, quote, My instructions were to seize the radio station and to hold it long enough to permit a Polish-speaking German, who would be at my disposal, to broadcast a speech in Polish. Heydrich told me that this speech should state that the time had come for conflict between German and Poles. Heydrich also told me that he expected an attack on Poland by Germany in a few days, end quote. Along with the plan for a radio message to be sent, there would be dead bodies placed at the radio station and at the nearest border crossing. These bodies would be dressed in Polish uniforms that were created by German intelligence for the purpose. The bodies would be those of concentration camp prisoners who were dressed in the uniforms, taken to the radio station and border crossing, drugged, and then shot. On September 1st, these bodies would then be presented as physical evidence of a Polish attack on Germany. The operation was carried out as planned at 9.30 p.m. on August 31st, providing the German government with its excuse to go to war, even if it was a completely fabricated one. Back at the front, preparations were already being made in the final minutes before the attack began. The Luftwaffe would begin launching its attack squadrons before 4.45 a.m. to give them time to reach their destinations, which meant that thousands of Luftwaffe pilots were were flying over the Polish border in the 15 to 20 minutes before the war started. One of those pilots was Erik Munsk, who would be in a squadron assigned to make their first wartime sorties against a collection of Polish airfields. Munsk would later recall that in their final briefing, the leading major had simply said, Gentlemen, off at 4.26 a.m., one aircraft every 20 seconds. Understood? End quote. After the briefing, squadron's leaders headed to their aircraft, and just a few minutes later, they began to take off on their way to their targets. Near the Polish border at 4.30, one soldier would write that the sun began to finally show its light and to start to provide faint light over the territory that they were about to move into. Alexander Stahlberg would be stationed near the Polish corridor, and he would write in his diary that he had spent the minutes before 4.45 a.m. just staring at his watch, waiting for it to start. And when the minute hand hit 45, artillery fire could be heard, and at that moment, quote, our infantry began to move up, carrying their rifles under their arms as if they were going hunting. Not a shot was fired, column after column rolled by for well over an hour. I looked at the soldiers' faces, seeing and hearing no excitement, no cheers. They were silent, their faces generally expressionless, end quote. All along the border, similar experiences would be had by millions of men. On the ground, they would begin to move forward under the dull roar of artillery, while in the skies above, the war had already started. When planning for the Polish invasion, the Luftwaffe had five key missions. The first four missions were in service of military objectives. Disable Polish communication and transportation capabilities, give close support to the army as required, disable all Polish naval capabilities, and reduce the ability of the Polish economy to produce armaments. The final mission was to launch a massed bombing attack on Warsaw, which wasn't necessarily quite as military in nature. To accomplish these tasks, Luftflot 1 and Luftflot 4 would have over 2,300 aircraft, which may seem like a very large number, but due to the various tasks that were assigned to them and the amount of territory that they had to cover, they were spread pretty thin. For comparison, during the invasion of France less than a year later, the Luftwaffe would have over 5,500 aircraft at its disposal, well over twice as many. The two Luftflotten were positioned roughly with each army group, one straddling the Polish corridor in the north and another with army group south in Silesia. They would then have the major task in front of them, but they would not be given all of the available aircraft to achieve it, which is kind of an interesting thing because substantial Luftwaffe forces would remain in western Germany due to concerns about the possibility of a British or French response to the invasion. This included around half of Germany's best frontline fighter, the BF-109E, which is a good indication of how much they feared a possible very quick and decisive British and French response. Regardless of how the aircraft were positioned, or what they planned to do with them, one of the most important factors were the plans of the Polish Air Force— The Polish aircraft, heavily outnumbered by around 5 to 1, had quite the task to accomplish in defending Poland. In the important part department of air defense, most of the Polish fighter aircraft were scattered around to the various army formations to provide defense of the border regions. Unfortunately for the Polish pilots, this often just resulted in them being heavily outnumbered at all moments, as they were unable to mass the number of aircraft necessary to meet the German fighters and bombing aircraft. 
The one piece of good news was that the Polish squadrons all around the nation had been dispersed to as many airfields as possible in the days before the invasion, which would greatly lessen the impact of early German bombing of the airfields. This at least gave them a chance to get in the air at least part of the time. The greatest concentration of fighters, though, was the Pursuit Brigade, which was assigned the task of defending Warsaw, and it would be over Warsaw that the 53 fighters of the brigade would experience some success. They would be given early raid warnings by hundreds of observation posts that had been erected around the capital, allowing for a better chance at getting off the tarmac in time to meet the attack in the time before radar was available. Unfortunately for all Polish pilots, as motivated and skilled as they might be, sometimes quantity is what matters. And in quantity, they would be opening minutes and hours of the operation. The Luftwaffe had two primary targets that the first bombing raids would largely be sent to attack, bridges and airfields. From an invasion perspective, destroying some bridges was an important way to control the movements of Polish forces, or to ensure that bridges remained intact for use by advancing German units. These were considered to be so important that they would end up being the very first targets hit by German bombers, often Stuka dive bombers, in the minutes before the invasion actually kicked off. While the ground invasion was not scheduled to start until 4.45, at 4.30 a.m., one of these attacks would be made on a bridge outside of Danzig when a group of three Stukas would make a dive bombing attack near a railway bridge over the Vistula River. The goal of this attack was not to destroy or even to damage the bridge, but to instead attempt to destroy the demolition equipment that the Poles had placed on and around the bridge so that it could be destroyed if the Germans invaded. Even though all three Stukas would release their bombs uh, roughly on target, the bridge would still be destroyed by Polish forces just an hour later before it could be used by German troops. Along with bombing bridges, there was also specific efforts made to interdict Polish railway traffic, which was the primary way that supplies and men moved up to the front lines. Erik Munsk, who I previously quoted, would participate in a bombing raid on a Polish troop train on their way to their primary target, an airfield. He would later write, quote, The locomotive and wagons were covered with green foliage. Men wave noisily from the windows with their caps and hats. A military train with Polish reservists. They have not recognized us. They believe we are friendly. The Polish troops would very quickly find out that the HE-111s were not friendly. Another crucial target for early German bombing raids were Polish airfields. Airfields all over western Poland would be visited in the early hours of the invasion in the Luftwaffe's quest to destroy as much of the Polish air force as possible in the early hours of the invasion. This is also exactly what the Polish leaders expected to happen, with one Polish officer later writing, quote, It attacked our airfields and tried to wipe out our aircraft on the ground. It seems quite naive of the Germans to have believed that during the preceding days of high political tension, and with their own obviously aggressive intentions, we would leave our units sitting in their peacetime bases, end quote. In total, these bombing raids would destroy, you know, around 200 aircraft, probably a little under that number, which was a solid portion of the total Polish air strength, but was a far cry from the Polish forces being completely destroyed on the ground, like what the Nazi propaganda would claim. One other major target for German raids was the Polish capital of Warsaw. The original German plans were for the first day of the invasion to also feature a large effort to bomb the capital, including aircraft from both of the Luftflotten. This would not be possible on September 1st due to the low cloud cover and fog that would cause problems for many German efforts over the course of the day. The fog cover varied greatly based on location, but in some areas of northern Poland it was up to 10,000 feet high, making accurate bombing nearly impossible and sort of halting a lot of flight operations. But the decision would be made to not completely abandon the plans to attack Warsaw, and instead of, you know, of large bombing raids throughout the day, there would just be a few more isolated and smaller attacks made. These were never as large as hopes, primarily due to the continuing weather problems, but they would reach the city. The first raid to appear over the capital would contain 34 HE-111s escorted by 24 BF-110Cs, the German two-engine heavy fighter. They had taken off from East Prussia and then began flying south, but had been spotted soon after they came over Polish territory by an observation post. This gave the Pursuit Brigade in Warsaw time to get into the air. The two forces would meet a little before 7.30 in the first major air confrontation of the Second World War. 
the Polish fighters were at a technical disadvantage, with their P-11C fighters outclassed in speed and armaments by the Bf-110s, with the Polish aircraft armed only with two machine guns against the cannons present on the German side. But even at such a disadvantage, five German bombers were shot down at the cost of four destroyed and many more damaged Polish aircraft. Another positive for the Pursuit Brigade was that the German bombers would drop their bombs early instead of on their intended targets in the city. The second raid of the day would arrive at 4 in the afternoon, this time a group of 30 Stukas with a second group of HE-111s and BF-110Cs and also some BF-109s arriving over the city about an hour after the Stukas. The coordination between the different groups of German aircraft was not perfect, including instances of German bombers firing on German fighters, but they far outnumbered the Polish fighters that were in the air to meet them when they arrived, and so they were able to make it to their targets. By the time the raid was over, the totals for the day were 10 German aircraft destroyed for the cost of 12 Polish aircraft destroyed. But the larger problem for the Poles was the number of damaged aircraft that would not be available for the next day's fighting, with around 20 fighters damaged to the point of not being combat capable on September 2nd. Given their existing numerical disadvantage, this kind of attrition was completely unsustainable. Warsaw was not the only Polish city that would be bombed on the first day of the war. In Poznan, there would be multiple air raids, one at around midday and another in the evening. The second raid targeted the train station, but many bombs fell simply around the train station. In cities like Poznan, Polish air defenses were even more heavily outnumbered than they were over Warsaw, and they would only be able to destroy one German bomber over the city. Over Krakow, raids would be carried out by DO-17 bombers, and they would experience even less Polish resistance. In the south, the weather was also better, making it easier to fly and hit targets on the ground. These are just two examples of countless German bombing raids made on September 2nd and the days immediately after. All around Poland, areas would experience German air attacks. Just to give a few examples, in the far north, where the Luftwaffe pilots targeted Polish naval facilities and the naval batteries at the Hell Peninsula. In central Poland, raids would be made on the Bug River bridges, and all along the front, smaller air raids would be made against countless targets. Often this was done in the service of providing close air support to the advancing German ground troops. Sometimes that meant targeting military units, and other times it meant bombing villages. From small villages all the way up to the largest city, the Germans would claim that they were bombing heavily defended areas, but often the only casualties were civilians. One of the more famous examples of this was the bombing of Vierlon that would take place throughout the day. Vierlon was entirely undefended, and there were no Polish military units based in the town, but that did not prevent multiple bombing raids from being ordered against the city. Eventually, three-quarters of the city was destroyed, and the total number of civilians killed was at least 127, and I've seen numbers quite a bit higher than that. Unfortunately, you know, for all the people all over Europe, this was just the beginning of bombing raids on civilian targets, both during the Polish campaign and until 1945. The bombing of Huelan would eventually be classified as a war crime due to it directly targeting civilian targets, but it would not be the only instance where civilian infrastructure was targeted by German bombing either on the 1st of September or, or on any days that followed. Overall, the Luftwaffe would fly over 2,000 sorties during the first day of the invasion, and there would be several successes. However, there were many problems with these opening operations that prevented them from being as successful as the Luftwaffe hoped. Contrary to Nazi propaganda, the Polish Air Force was not destroyed on the ground, and in fact most of its planes would be operational during the first day of the invasion. They would certainly experience attrition on the first day and for every day afters, but, but they were not immediately destroyed. The second challenge was around their bombing targets. There were many Polish villages, towns, and cities bombed during the day, over a hundred, but they were not as impactful as the Luftwaffe planners hoped they would be. I think most of this can be attributed to the fact that there was a drastic overestimation of how much damage aerial bombing could do to a city and civilian and industrial infrastructure, something that would be proven time and time again over the next six years. It was a problem that could only be solved by larger numbers of bombing aircraft and fewer targets and more bombs, and even then the results are debated. The third challenge experienced in the early days of the Polish campaign resulted in more actionable information. The communication between ground forces and air support just took too long. This made it difficult for an officer on the ground to get air support in a timely manner, which resulted in missed opportunities and delays. 
This had also been experienced during pre-war exercises, but just the sheer scale of the actions during the invasion and the geographic area that it covered made the delays far greater than during those exercises. This final challenge would turn into a great learning experience for the Luftwaffe for future campaigns. While the invasion of Poland had started, Hitler would send a proclamation to the German army on September 1st, giving in its briefest form the reason that many Germans now found themselves invading a foreign nation. Quote, the Polish state has refused the peaceful settlement of relations which I desired, and has appealed to arms. Germans in Poland are persecuted with bloody terror and driven from their houses. A series of violations of the frontier, intolerable to a great power, prove that Poland is no longer willing to respect the frontier of the Reich. In order to put an end to this lunacy, I have no other choice than to meet force with force from now on. The German army will fight the battle for the honor and the vital rights of reborn Germany with hard determination. I expect that every soldier, mindful of the great traditions of eternal German soldiery, will ever remain conscious that he is a representative of the National Socialist Greater Germany. Long live our people and our Reich. End quote. Back in Berlin on the morning of September 1st, Hitler would speak before the Reichstag. During this speech, Hitler would reiterate many of the reasons that he felt that Germany had to go to war. As always, with speeches of this kind, Hitler was in full propaganda mode when speaking of how much patience he had exercised over the previous months and years, constantly pushing for peace when those pesky Poles were simply unwilling to compromise. He would then claim that the actions of the German military were simply an attempt to, quote, speak to Poland in the same language that Poland for months past has used towards us, this was all, of course, a fabrication, just total lies. Hitler would also speak to the Western nations, stating that he believed the Western borders of Germany to be completely acceptable, and that he did not want a conflict with Britain and France. One interesting feature of this speech is that Hitler does not use the word war. It's not an announcement that Germany was going to war with Poland, or that it had declared war, or any other usage of the word war in that way. To quote from Roger Morehouse and his excellent work, Poland 1939, The Outbreak of World War II, quote, For all the hyperbole, however, one word that was conspicuously absent from the speech was war. As the memorandum sent from Berlin to all German embassies and consulates that night made clear, the word was to be scrupulously avoided. Quote, the action is for the present not to be described as war, the instruction read, but merely as engagements which have been brought about by Polish attacks. I find this really interesting because this is a common tactic by governments who are, who are launching a war to make sure they don't call it a war so that their enemies or other nations don't see it or cannot claim that it is a war, even though it's clearly a war. On the evening of September 1st, the first wartime editions of Polish newspapers would be printed with news of the German invasion, with the Warsaw Evening stating, quote, The whole nation in defense of freedom, with faith, trust, and courage, we go into battle. Radio broadcasts would also be made to inform the Polish public of some of the events of the day, with, of course, a bit of spin to keep up morale. These news bulletins would be accompanied by patriotic music and uplifting snippets of events at the front, like Polish cavalry moving into East Prussia. To quote from a broadcast made by Roman Umiastowski, quote, We are ready. Wherever the enemy has attacked, he has run into a wall of our resistance against which his attacks have been smashed. We are not merely defending ourselves successfully, we are also attacking. Two brigades of Polish cavalry have crossed the border of East Prussia and are pressing forward continually to rescue our brothers in the Mysterian Lakes and Ermland. Soldiers, fight heroically. You are fighting for a just cause. The moment of victory is at hand. End quote. Unfortunately for the Polish troops at the front, things were not going as well as that radio broadcast might have made it seem. Join me next episode, and we will look at the Polish defense of the German invasion out of East Prussia, as well as the ill-fated defense of Danzig and the Pol